Hello. This workshop is being recorded for parents and students who were not able to attend our first College 101 class on the SATs and ACTs. This is a class that I enjoy teaching because I know how confusing the entire application process can be. I also know how important it is for you to submit your college application early. Some of you will be applying in October of your senior year, so you don't quite have as much time as you may have thought before you entered this workshop today. It is my hope that you're able to participate in all four sessions so that you can submit the best application possible and that you're able to do so as stress-free as possible. Remember, if it's February, it's College 101 month. I thought we would start by talking about the structure of the College 101 classes so that you know what to expect over the next few weeks. If you attend all of these classes, you will not only be knowledgeable about the process, but you will also have completed many of the necessary steps as well. My goal is to keep each class under an hour with most classes averaging around 40 minutes in length. Some of our sessions may be a little bit longer, especially next week on February 8th, when we have a workshop with the admissions office at the University of Mary Washington. We also will do a workshop a little bit later where you'll begin to work on the common application, which is the application used by most colleges. This workshop as well will be a little bit longer than 40 minutes. After each class, there's a small homework assignment for you to complete in between sessions. This is not a graded assignment. It's really just designed to help keep you on track. Now, I know nobody really wants to be here at 6 p.m. when we hold these workshops, but stick with it. And I promise that this class will be well worth your time. Now, before we even get to the ACT SAT portion of tonight's presentation, I wanna give you a brief 30 second commercial announcement. We are now in the process of scheduling classes for next school year. Some of you may have already completed this process, but as you plan your senior year courses, there's a few things that you need to be aware of. Number one, your colleges want to see an upward trajectory in your coursework. This means that if you are taking an honors English class this year, then you should be at the level of honors or higher next school year. This becomes increasingly important as we move to more of a test optional admissions process, which we're going to talk about a little bit later in this workshop. The second thing I want you to know, choose classes that challenge you. For years, I would run a college admissions program where admissions representative reviewed actual student transcripts. They would look at the transcript and they would tell the audience whether or not they would admit or deny this particular student based on grades and extracurricular activities. The first thing many of these college representatives do was count up the number of college level and advanced classes that our school offered and compared that to the student transcript. That was one of the most important predictors to them of future college success. Now you may or may not know this, but King George High School is actually required to produce a school profile with every college application that informs the college as to the number of courses that we offer at an AP dual enrollment or honors level. The third thing I want you to know is that any changes you make to your senior year schedule must be reported to your college. So choose your classes well, because you don't want your college to see that you started out by taking a higher level course, like an AP course, and you ended up dropping it as the year went on. So your counselors are required to report to colleges um, any changes in courses or discipline throughout the course of the senior year. All right, I guess that was a little more than 30 seconds, but it really is good information that I wanted you to be aware of. Now, when I talk about college admissions exams or entrance exams, I am talking about both the SAT and the ACT. And we receive a lot of questions about these tests and when to take them, and how many times should you take them? These exams were written and designed to be taken at the end of the junior year of high school. Even the college board, the SAT people, tell students and parents the end of the junior year is the most appropriate time to take the test. Now, how many times should you take the test? Our recommendation is at least two, but anywhere from one to three would be appropriate. The reason I say two is the magic number 
is because research, research shows that there's typically an improvement between test one and test two. Now this could be in part due to experience with actually taking the exam, or it could be due to additional instruction that's been provided through the school day. We do have students that take the test three or more times, but if you ask an admissions committee, if they see that you took a test, um, especially if you're taking it four or five or more times, um, they can actually view that negatively, thinking that you didn't take the test seriously or were not as well prepared as maybe you could have been the first time or two you've taken it. One of the other reasons why you might want to take the test twice is because many colleges super score. Super score is when they take your best critical reading score and your best math score from all tests you've taken. So they'll, they might take the highest critical reading score from your first SAT or ACT, um, and then take your higher math score from a different exam. And this results in them creating a brand new score for you that is higher than either one of the two individual tests would have been on their own. So taking it twice can, come, can definitely benefit you due to super scoring. The last thing I want you to know about SAT or ACT exams is that you as the student own the scores. You can choose what you release to your college. Now it's important for you to know that we, meaning King George High School, are required by the state to list your highest test score on your transcript. However, parents that are listening, you can write a note and send it to the counseling office asking us to remove these scores from the transcript. If we take these scores off, then it gives you more ability to look at whether or not you wanna send your scores to a college, especially when we start talking about test optional schools. I really wanted to put this in here so that I did not forget to mention that if you are a student with a disability, an IEP or a 504 plan, you have the ability to request test accommodations. It is a lengthy process, so if you have not applied for these accommodations, please see your counselor ASAP so that we can begin the process. All right, now let's get to the meat of the presentation, test optional colleges. Over 80% of all colleges are now test optional. This is really different than when I went to school or when many parents went to school because when we went to school, the SATs and ACTs were required. You needed them as part of the admissions process. However, over the past decade, colleges have been moving towards more of a test optional admissions process. This was already in place, but then when COVID hit and all SATs and ACTs were canceled, um, it caused a great deal of concern among students and parents. Yet many colleges in our area and across the country were already prepared for this because they have been transitioning to this test optional policy um, over the last decade. So it may be new to parents or students, but it is not new to colleges. And as I've said, 80% of all colleges are now test optional. This whole test optional movement really came out of concern for equity and transparency in the admissions process. And also because colleges really felt that there were other predictors of future success that were more accurate such as an overall GPA and the types of classes taken in high school. Now, the most important thing to remember about test optional is that it may not mean no testing is involved. So let's take, take a look at the test optional colleges and what that might mean to you. The most that test optional. Test optional means that a college has decided to use other factors when making an admissions decision. Test optional schools are looking at things other than testing. So they're really looking at things like your overall GPA. Your essays carry a lot more weight. Recommendations and extracurricular activities are really viewed um, with more scrutiny if it's test optional. Um, one thing to consider with test optional is the best way to prove that you are college ready is to take a course like a dual enrollment or AP course, which are college level. And this really demonstrates that you're able to handle that college level work. Another type of test optional college is called test flexible college. There are not many of these in the country, but I wanted to put it up here in case one of you ran into a test flex flexible college, not easy to say. Test flexible means 
they will take any score. It doesn't have to be an SAT or ACT score. They will use an AP score, for example, um, to determine whether or not admissions is appropriate. Again, not that common. The last option you see is the test blind school. Colleges that do not consider test scores at all, even if you send them in, are considered test blind. Just like test optional schools, every other item on your application will carry a little more weight since they no longer have the tests to rely upon. Now, nothing's easy in college admissions, and you're going to learn as we go through these classes, there are multiple layers to everything that we talk about. So it's important for you to know that test optional schools all have different policies, and test optional may not mean the same thing to every college you apply to. So research is going to be really important here. So just to give you an example, some test optional schools have restrictions. And that means you might look at the website quickly and it will say, we are test optional. And then you look at the nursing program you want to apply to and you will see the nursing program requires SAT or ACT exams. It's not uncommon to see that in a nursing program. You may see that this college is test optional, but another major other than nursing may want SAT or ACT exams as well. So it's really important that you research your colleges. Now, for those of you out there that may be strong candidates for merit or presidential scholarships, um, you should know that a college can be test optional, but the scholarships may require an SAT or an ACT exam. So you've really got to ask some questions of admissions. What does test optional mean to them? Will you need it for your major? or will you need it for a scholarship? Again, test optional schools are really going to scrutinize every other component of your application because they do not have scores. So with all of these test optional policies, how can you begin to keep track? On the bottom of this slide, you're going to see that there is a link. And when I send you the PowerPoint, you'll have it and you can click on it. Fair test. Um, does a really good job at keeping track on a regular basis of what test optional means to each school or college that's out there. All right, now that you've learned about test optional schools and why you might wanna take an SAT or ACT, even if your college is test optional, remember those scholarships or certain majors may require them. I want you to look at two examples because a very common question that we receive in our office is should I submit my scores or not? And there's a good general rule of thumb that will help you understand this whole process. Every college is required to post a freshman profile. And in that profile, they list something called the 50th percentile for test scores. So generally speaking, if your test score is in the 50th percentile or higher than the average admitted student, you can submit your score. So let's look at two examples. Example one. Duke, the mid 50% range is 1500 to 1560. You scored a 1420, which is an exceptional score, but you're applying to Duke with a 1420. Should you submit it or should you not? The general rule of thumb and recommendation is to not submit the 1420 because it is lower than the freshman, typical freshman um, profile that they're looking at and accepting. In that case, you want to really build strong references, strong um, course load, and make sure that you're really involved in extracurricular activities. But yet, if we look at another school, example number two, ODU, the middle 50% is 980 to 1180. Should you submit that 1420 to ODU? The answer there is absolutely yes. And you may even get some scholarship potentials. So, um, it's gotten a little more difficult than it used to be where everyone took an SAT and we sent them to every school. Um, there's a little bit of strategy involved here and please do seek out your counselor if you have any questions. All right, now let's look at the actual two tests and compare them. One of the questions we also receive is which one should I take, ACT or SAT? Um, both tests are based on the school curriculum and both are, um, designed to be taken at the end of the junior year. 
Both tests are accepted at a colleges at any school that will accept a college entrance exam. On the screen, I'm not going to read it to you and you'll have this again in the PowerPoint slide when I send it home. Um, you can see how they compare side by side. The biggest difference between the two exams is that the ACT allows you to use calculators on all portions and questions. The SAT currently does not. That will be changing in two years time, but not enough to affect um, your, your class. So those are two differences right there with math, two different ways they view it. In terms of science, the ACT does give science questions as part of the exam and the SAT really limits it to reading, writing, and math. For parents out there, um, the College Board SAT has eliminated both the SAT2 and the optional essay. Um, the scores for these exams vary with the SAT ranging from 400 to 1600 and the ACT ranging from 1 to 36. I put this slide up here because um, you might take an ACT and an SAT and you wonder how they compare to each other. We call that a concordance table and it will tell you how a 31 on an ACT compares to a 1200 on an SAT. So the only way to really know which one of these two exams to take is to take a practice exam. You can click these links when you get the PowerPoint and it'll take you directly to a practice SAT and a practice ACT. And generally we find when students take a, a portion of a practice exam that you're going to figure out one test appears to be maybe a little bit easier, not the right word, but easier for you because the questions um, make more sense or because you're really strong at science or you just like the way um, one of the exams works over the other. So the only way to really know is to take a practice test. Now, both of these exams do have practice sites, both the SAT and the ACT, and it's free. In terms of the SAT, I want to talk a little bit about Khan Academy. When you take a PSAT, and most of our students um, have, so you have a PSAT somewhere, a score somewhere most likely, you can link those scores to Khan Academy. The College Board actually created individualized test prep through Khan Academy for you. So when you link your PSAT scores to Khan Academy, the computer algorithms go through and determine these are subjects that you do really well on and you don't need practice, so it'll throw those away. It will then go in and say, for you to do the best job that you can, um, this is the area you need to work on. So you'll begin to see practice videos, practice questions on specific things you need to address to get a higher score on the SAT. Um, ACT does not have a similar practice, um, but SAT Khan Academy is really quite excellent, individualized. Every student gets a different test prep. Also, the test prep looks different based on when you say you wanna take the next exam. So if you say you wanna take it in March, you'll have a schedule that kind of speeds it up a little bit for you so that you'll be ready by March. If you put June or July, a later date, um, then it gives you a totally different plan, even though your PSAT scores were the same. Now let's take a look at the test dates. Every test or almost every test of the SAT um, is given here at King George. I wanna point out on this site, you're looking at test dates and I wanna go through the three most common that students take. One is March 12th. The thing that you need to know about March 12th is that it's the first day of our spring break. So check into your travel plans before you book a March 12th test date. May 7th is a popular test date for students who take a lot of AP exams. Um, that may not be the best date for you because you are going to be right in the middle of that testing cycle. And then we have June 4th as the test date. June 4th is, of course, summer vacation, but it's a good date for a lot of people because you have some time to work on Khan Academy after school gets out before you register. Two things I want you to note looking at this slide up here, we have a CEEB code. You will need that code for many things in high school, including SAT and ACT test registration. So make sure you keep that number handy. The other thing I want you to know is 
both the SAT and the ACT are very strict with deadlines. If you miss a registration deadline, they will tack on a late fee. Even if you only miss the deadline by 30 minutes, um, there will be a late fee. To register, click the button down here when you get the slide and it'll take you directly to the registration page. Now the ACT test dates are up here on the screen. Um, again, ACT are accepted by colleges all over the country. We just do not give the ACT in King George. You can register at ACT testing and you can put in the test locator and you'll be able to view different sites across Virginia or you can even test um, for the SAT or ACT at any location if you are away on vacation. So let's talk cost and fees. The ACT is $60 without the essay. If you choose to take the essay, it's $85. Now, what I want you to know about the essay is the SAT used to have an essay as well. And what they found out is colleges did not use the essay, so they dropped the essay component. So you wanna keep that in mind when you register for an ACT, you may not need the essay. It's $60 for the ACT. $52 for the SAT. We do have a limited number of fee waivers. And if you think you're eligible due to free or reduced lunch or um, for any other reason, please see your counselor. Now, the last thing I wanna mention about cost is whenever you send an SAT score directly from the testing agency, there's a fee. But when you register for an SAT or an ACT, they will give you free reports as part of the registration process. If you go in and pick the colleges, you can do that, it's free. However, those scores will be sent directly to the college and you may have wanted to apply test optional, but you've lost that ability because you use the free score reports. So just keep that in mind um, that you may want to see your SAT or ACT scores before you send them to any colleges. Um, colleges can get the ACT scores to SAT and ACT scores two ways. One, from a high school transcript. And two, if they do not accept it from the high school transcript, there is a small fee. I believe it's about $6 to send to each individual school. How to sign up for an SAT or ACT. The links are here. Again, you'll get it in the PowerPoint. You can just click them but make sure you have a computer with internet. You're going to need a credit card or other online payment. You're going to need a copy of your transcript, or you need to know all of your high school course details, such as classes you've taken and grades in those courses. So when you came in for your junior scheduling meetings, you should already have a copy of your transcript. If not, visit the counseling office before you sit down to register. And the last thing you need to know is you are asked for a headshot photo. Um, they actually do want a photo of you to make sure that you look like the person who's coming in to test on test day. I always tell my students, when you um, once you take your photo for the SAT or ACT, please make sure that you do not change your looks too much or you run the risk that you show up on test day, you do not look like the photo, and it has happened that people have been de denied admissions into the testing center. A few things about scores. Once you take the actual SAT or ACT, the scores are posted online first. You will see them before your counselor will. ACT typically posts them anywhere from two to eight weeks. Um, after testing, typically you see them within two to three weeks. The SAT is a little bit more specific and will share um, on their website when scores are specifically released and it is about two weeks time. Now, before we meet on February 8th, try to take a photo and register for the exam that you wish to take. It will take you about 30 minutes, unless of course you keep retaking your picture to get a better photo. Our next class is everything you need to know about college admissions, 6 p.m. This class is in the high school auditorium and we hope to see you there. Thanks for joining in.